pay and begin our proceedings for tonight with all expectation to the glory of God. Father, we say we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and say we, we, we are so joyous and jubilant of the fact that what you've done for us on the cross is priceless. And it's because of that that we are gathered here as, as the least of our appreciation in what you've done. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saturated with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I pray that, Father, the word of God will have free course and prevail over our thinking processes. And I pray that, Father, by this word prevailing over our thinking processes, Father, it will cause us to be aglow with your spirit. It will cause us to be enthusiastic, serving the Lord with all joy. And if there's anything that is contrary to sound doctrine in our understanding, we root it out, whether it's in the form of slowness to understand, dullness of perception, indifference, pride, unpersuadableness, traditions of men and women, religious mindsets that do not conform to what Christ has laid down. And Father, I pray that the rainfall of the Holy Spirit will be so mighty. I pray for light. I pray for utterance, Father, and I pray that the light of God's word will be so much prevalent that it will swallow up anything that is of darkness in our understanding. May clarity be the hallmark of our teachings, that not only are we only going to hear the word, but Father will be able to do it, put it into practice, be mindful of it so that we can maximize what you've done for us. I thank you for the lives of all those that are here to the praise and to the glory of your name. I stifle every operation of darkness in the atmosphere, over this platform, over our minds, that the name of the Lord will be preeminent at the end of it all. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, and all the saints shall say a mighty, mighty amen. Well, 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 glory, praise the name of the living God. Well, good evening and welcome to our evening uh, teaching devotional from the quarters of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, Christ Revealed Center, all the way from the east of London. And you know what I'm going to say, the east of London is only where good things happen. <laughs> you can claim anything else for yourself, but I maintain that the east of London is where good things happen. Never forget, never forget, it was here that the Olympics were held. They didn't think of any other place in all of, of London. They didn't think of West London, North London. They brought the Olympics. So it's it's a complete play, great, great hallmark for that. Don't forget prime residential buildings all over Docklands. Come and think of it. You will not get it anywhere else in London except in the Docklands. <laughs> and there are still more developments going on. So move on to the east of London. Move on. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> Leave the east, the north, <laughs> the southwest. Come to the east. <laughs> That's where everything is happening. You are missing out a lot if you don't come to the east of London. <laughs> Glory, don't mind me. I'll just be my little thing here. Anyway, thank you uh, for being here. Our teaching devotional, Epignosis Online or Epignosis Daily. We said the word Epignosis um, just simply means accurate knowledge, precise knowledge, comprehensive knowledge, and it was used primarily by Apostle Paul in referring to his writings. So we can safely say that the writings of the apostles, Paul, Peter, James, John, the writer of Hebrews can be put under the collective brand of the word epignosis. They are the already correctly divided word of God. You don't need to scratch your head to find out which one is correctly divided. Romans to the first four chapters of the book of Revelation, they are the correctly explained word of God. That means any concept in the word of God must be found in those books. If you can't find them in those books, then it cannot be considered as doctrinal matter in that regard. On behalf of myself, Pastor Fred, Lady Patience, the diaconia, the leadership of the church, we say welcome to Believers Bible Study Fellowship and make sure you are ready with your notebooks and pens. If you are not ready, and you can take screenshots. It is also well and good. Also, pay attention and listen to the whole thing 
and I guarantee you that there'll be something that will be etched in your memory. All right, so without much ado, uh, let us get into the throes of this. And as usual, I just want to go through my rounds of just quick, a quick welcome to everybody. Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Safari. Thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you also, um, Sister Beatrice, um, all the way from, from, from Germany. I use, the, I use the title sister, brother, because we are sisters and brothers in Christ. No matter the relationship, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hallelujah. Even my children, the males will be brothers in Christ, the females will be sisters in Christ, because, you know, once we, we, we are united in Christ, that is the family album. All right, also, Sister Daniela, bless you, bless you for being here as well. And Sister Sheila, the minstrel, thank you very much for being here. The sax are in the house. Mr. and Mrs. Sarkodier, thank you. Sister Nina, thank you very much. Sister Lady Perpetual, thank you very much for being here. Auntie Vivian, thank you very much for being here. Reverend Adikolate, um, the pastor in charge or the bishop in charge, full gospel group of churches in Italy. Thank you very much. Well, we are in for a rollicking ride in the study of God's word. God's word is always exciting. So shall we just dive into this and get it? So let's remind ourselves of what we are dealing with um, in, since we started in June. And we are dealing with understanding the book of Revelation exegetically according to the doctrine of Christ as a series. Now, let me, for starters, bring your mind to what we are trying to do here. What we are trying to do here is to show everybody through the teaching of the word that the word of God has got a singular theme. It's a singular theme that runs through Genesis to Revelation. Now, once you, co you can't grasp that, then that is when you're going to think that the word of God is about many different things. But the word of God, it has a singular theme. Some of it, that same singular theme might be in metaphorical statements, might be in similes, allegories, euphemisms, might be, you know, in a poetic style, but it's still the same. The language might be different. The language might be different depending on the audience, but the theme is still the same. Okay, so don't lose sight of that fact. Don't lose sight of that fact. Then we also said that in all that, there are two key things that we must never forget. Two key things, never forget. The moment you think that the word of God, the Bible is about many, 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 many different things, then your understanding is not clear. And this is what is happening by and large. So I want you to follow me, do not listen to it with a critical spirit. Listen with the spirit to learn. We unlearn to relearn. Okay, so let us get through a few things about it. Let me just quickly run through for the sake of those who just uh, joined us. We are dealing with the misconceptions of Revelation chapter 3, right? So far, we've dealt with Revelation chapters 1 and 2. We've gone through all that. We've dealt with the church in Ephesus, Thyatira, Pergamon. We've also explained what we call the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I'm not going to go into that. We have got a YouTube channel. You can go to the YouTube channel, F for Freddy, G for Golf, C for Charlie, I for India, London, FGC London. You type that in, you type that in there and all our videos will pop up. So if you replay it, you understand what we meant by the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We also dealt with the doctrine of Balaam. Remember the word doctrine refers to what? Explanation style. So when we say the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, explanations after the style of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine of Balaam, explanations after the style of Balaam. The doctrine of Jezebel, explanation after the style or using Jezebel as a metaphor in a kind of explanation. We said all these are different from the doctrine of Christ or the explanation style that Jesus put down after resurrection. We said there is no demon spirit called Jezebel. Don't make that mistake. It is just a language metaphor or no, or maybe an allegory just to try and bring across a spiritual truth. So don't get carried away. You know, I, I hear some people talk about uh, because a certain lady put on big earrings and put on, you know, uh, maybe uh, what do you call it? Q-Tex or whatever it is. They say she's Jezebel. You know, that, 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 that's a misnomer. No, that's not, that's not what it means. It is talking about how Jezebel influenced the husband Okay. Did they talk about Jezebel's dressing? They didn't talk about her dressing. It is the influence of the husband Ahab 
which is what they are trying to let you understand that just as Jezebel allowed her mind so that she would influence the husband negatively, so also Satan would influence the body of Christ in teaching away from what Christ has laid down. That's all it just means. So please, let us stop this thing about that we are referring to Jezebel as a kind of a spirit, a demon, or the way somebody is dressing. That's wrong. There's nothing like that in the Bible. It's people put, pushing it to the extreme, you know? So please take that out of your mind. Take that out of your mind. We use the word Jezebel as a metaphor for the way she influenced the husband away from the word of God. That's what we are dealing with. And the same way Satan tried to influence people away from the true word of the living God. We've dealt with all that. Then we said what Jezebel did was that she tried to influence Ahab away, okay? And that focused more on magical things. So in the doctrine of Jezebel, these churches, they try to always talk about the depths of Satan. They try to make Satan look like a mystery. The topic is all about Satan, demons, demons, Satan, mommy water, all those kind of things. We call them the doctrine of trying to know the depths of Satan. Then we also said, and I repeat again before I go on, that in looking at what the apostles wrote about Satan, they did not even give any details. Let me give you where Satan is mentioned about four or five or six places in the word of the living God, right? So we, we got the first one where it goes in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds, okay? So the strongholds is what thinking pattern in our mind away from what Christ has done. Then in Ephesians chapter 6, from verse number 12, it talks about the fact that for we wrestle not, for we wrestle not against powers, principalities, did you notice in that in that verse, Paul did not go into any further details whether these demons are tall, they are short, they are young, they are old, they are fat, they are thin, they are red, they are blue. He didn't go into all those details. It does none in there. There, the only thing he said there was that the believer is superior to them. He calls them rulers of darkness. The believer is not in darkness. The believer is light. Again, the believer is not in darkness. The Bible says, ye are light. And he calls these spirits rulers of darkness. Who is darkness? The man without Christ. So you are not ruled by them. So Paul was not trying to say you must fight them. He was just informing you that our opposition comes from that realm. However, in chapter 1, he made it clear in verse 19, 20, and 21 that, that Jesus whom we are united with, is seated above these powers and is far above powers, principalities, mights, thrones, dominions, already in chapter one. So how can he come to chapter six of the same book and then try and make some kind of caricature and try and deify these, these spirits? No, the believer is superior to Satan. The person that is born again today is superior to Satan and all demons. Every believer is superior to Satan. Why? You are seated together in Christ in the heavenlies, far above. See that? Far above. That's where we are. So what Paul was saying, Paul was not saying that fight them. Paul was saying they are already defeated. Keep them there. They are already defeated. Keep them there. See that now? Now, let's move away from the Where else did the apostles write about Satan? Right? Then Paul spoke again in 2 Corinthians and said, For we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. That's all he said. Then also in 1 John chapter 3, John said, Let us not be like Cain, who was influenced by Satan. That is all he said. That's what, so right from Romans all the way through to the book of Revelation, where he was called the accuser of the brethren, there are no details of demon spirits. All that the Spirit of God wants us to know is that they are defeated, we are superior to them, they are under our feet. What did Jesus say about them after resurrection? In my name, you will cast them out. End of story. Then in Luke 10, 19, he says that, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, which is what? Symbolic of Satan and demons. He said, I give you power. 
but at that time, they had not gone to the cross. I give you power. That was even before he went to the cross. I give you power to tread. Tread is what? Relative to dominion. He said to tread. tread. What, what do you tread on? What do you use to step on? Your feet. Showing that their position is under you. These demons are below you. These demons and Satan, they are below you. Remember, Satan is not God. Satan is, was an angel who fell. An angel. That's why I said that. For Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So I don't understand why in our churches, there's so much emphasis and wasting of time on Satan. I don't know if you've noticed that. We spend hours, hours, demon, 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 fire, Satan, fire, Satan, Satan, one hour, Satan, two hours, Satan, three hours. Then some even go to fast and go to mountains. Again, Satan, Satan, you do not understand the power of the gospel. Jesus will never do anything flimsy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he said, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Come on, that. Don't you understand? The material of the born again spirit man is Christ. The material of our spirit is Christ. And Christ is superior to Satan. So it means the believer is superior to Satan. You can be sleeping, you're superior to Satan. You can be dozing, you're superior to Satan. There is nothing you can do about it. So maintain your stand. So the doctrine of trying to know the depth of Satan are teachings that try to deify and amplify Satan as a certain being that will some power that there's nothing we can do about. That is not the teaching of Christ. If you look at the consistent teaching of Christ by the apostles, they constantly emphasize the believer is superior to Satan. Now, someone will say, but why are things happening to me? Because you don't know how to use your authority. You don't know how to use your authority. You are not aware of your authority in Christ. So we did about that. All right. So with that at the back of our mind, let us now come to Revelation chapter 4. And I want us to look at something there in Revelation chapter 4. Therefore, we said, therefore, any Bible book, chapter, or verse that seems to contradict these two concepts will need diligent explanation, okay? And then we came to the area of, the, of those statements which said about he who overcomes. We said that it was not a futuristic thing. We made it clear that it's about what Christ has already done. All right. So with that at the back of our mind, let's go to Revelation chapter 4. And I want you to look at this image. Because this image is what we are going to deal with in today's teaching in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. And probably chapter six. Now you can see on your screen. I don't know if you can see clearly. The image. Let me make it smaller so it will fit everybody's screen. Let me see if that is right. Yep. Let's see here. All right. So let's go to the image here that we have on our screen. Okay. So here we are. So this is this is an image of what was called the high priest under the Old Testament. The high priest under the Old Testament. Okay. Every dressing on this man was symbolic. Please take note that the high priest was specially chosen from a special tribe, the tribe of Levi. We call them the Levitical priesthood. Nobody could be part of that except you are from that tribe. Nobody could be a high priest except in that tribe. Okay? There were priests and we have got high priests. Nobody, nobody can be represented as a high priest except they are chosen. And that high priest prefigures Christ. The high priest prefigures Christ. And we shall look at that duty. Now, what are we trying to do here? We are trying to let you know that the book of Revelation, right, is a reminder of what we have in Christ. It is not about future events. No, it is about events that have happened at the time of the writing of John. Okay, so now let's begin to go to Revelation chapter 4 and let us look at some salient aspects of this so that you know that the word of God is consistent. The word of God is consistent. So before that, let me read a few two verses and we'll jump to Revelation chapter 4. Let's go to Luke chapter 24 from verse 25. This after resurrection. And Jesus said to them, he said to two people on the road to a mouse, Oh, foolish ones, 
sluggish in mind, dull of perception, and slow of heart to believe, adhere, to trust, and rely on everything that the prophets have spoken. So what Jesus was telling these two people was that what the prophets have spoken is excellent enough, is sure enough, carries weight enough, is complete enough. You didn't need to see me resurrected to believe. Verse 26, was it not necessary and essentially fitting that the Messiah, Christ the Messiah, should suffer? The word Messiah means savior, should suffer all these things. What were the things he suffered? From Gethsemane all the way down to the cross, all the way down to his death, all the way down to the Hades, three days and three nights, then before he was made alive, then before he resurrected, then before he appeared, then he ascended, then he sat and he indwells the believer. He said, was it not necessary and essentially fitting that the Christ should suffer all these things before he enters into his glory? Then look at what Jesus did to them. Now remember, when Jesus spoke these words, none of the books of the New Testament that we call today New Testament were ready. So definitely, it can be referring to Genesis to Revelation, He's referring to Genesis to Malachi. So look at verse 27. Then, that's after resurrection, beginning with Moses or the writings of Moses and throughout all the prophets, the major prophets, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, all the way to Malachi. How did Jesus explain the Old Testament to them? He went on explaining and interpreting to them in all the scriptures. Take note, he called the writings of Moses, the writings of the prophets, the scriptures, the scriptures. And he said, those scriptures, what is their main aim? The things in those scriptures concerning and referring to himself. Wow. Genesis to Malachi, when you put it together, the sum total, the summary is pointing to Christ. He repeated the same thing in verse number 44. Now this time to the 11 disciples. Then he said to them, who are the them? 11 disciples minus Judas Iscariot. This is what I told you while I was with you. In other words, all my parables, all my teachings that we call the Beatitudes, all of them had a central theme. He said, when I was with you, what was it? I was trying to tell you and communicate everything which was written concerning me where in the law of Moses. So the law of Moses was a pointer to what Christ would do to sin in his death, burial, resurrection. And the prophets, the writings of the prophet, you will not see Jesus going to die expressly or explicitly in there by saying that when you put it together, that's what he's pointing to. And the prophets, and even the Psalms must be fulfilled. Look at that now. And then the verse... 45, then he thoroughly opened their minds to understand the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, which means up till now, nobody, nobody, with the exception of a few, David, Moses, one or two, nobody knew that Genesis to Malachi referred to what Jesus will do to the sin of Adam in his death burial resurrection including the disciples then he thoroughly opened their minds the statement opened their minds is the first time that that word was entered into the greek lexicon that means a first time like when jesus spoke to the man that was deaf he said ephrata be open first time the man heard sound first time their minds were brought to the summary or the central theme of Genesis to Malachi. Then look at the verse 46. And he said to them, thus it is written in Genesis to Malachi. But if you don't read it well, you wouldn't see that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Did you see that? Let me jump to another Bible verse. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10. I am trying to bring your mind to let you know that the Bible has only one theme. So the book of Revelation cannot be separate apart from the remaining 65 books. 
The moment you think that the gospel is about different things, you do not understand the gospel. And this is what has messed up African churches, South American churches, and Asian churches. That we think the gospel is about other things apart from this. But Jesus says the central theme of the message is what he did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Look at Peter corroborating what Jesus said in Luke 24. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10. The prophets who prophesied, which prophets of the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, what did they prophesy about? Of the grace, of the divine blessing. What is the divine blessing? The gift of salvation, the gift of the Spirit of God. He said, which was intended for you, they at their time in the Old Testament, even though they were speaking, they didn't understand, they searched and inquired. When you search and inquire, it means you don't have a complete revelation. Earnestly about this salvation. Did you see that? So once again, the focus of the writings of the Old Testament is salvation by faith in Christ. Very, very clear. So now with that at the back of our mind, let's jump into Revelation chapter 4. The Bible says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I gave you Luke chapter 24. I gave you 1 Peter 1. So that is two witnesses I've given you there. Now let's come to the book of Revelation. Yeah. And I'm going to do a quick read through. Then we begin to go into the key aspects. We said when Jesus in Luke 24 was traveling from Genesis to Malachi, he did not explain every sentence, every word, every, 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 every syntax. No, he only took out what was relative to his death, burial, and resurrection as the primary essential. Anything that was not in line with that, he did not touch it. So if Jesus himself in the first Bible study did that to the 11 apostles, which they took and taught others throughout Acts of the Apostles. We can do the same with the book of Revelation. The, the mistake I was discussing with one of my pastor friends that many do with the book of Revelation that they want to try and understand every word, word for word, word for word, sentence for sentence. When they do that, that's when they run into error. Because remember that the book of Revelation is heavy with metaphors. Revelation 4, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing opening in heaven. And I said that word heaven is descriptive. It's not one. There's no word in the Bible that has a what? An omnibus application. Every word must be understood within its context. And the first voice which I heard addressing me, like the calling of a word trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place in the future. And at once I came under the Holy Spirit's power and behold, I... Behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, three, and he who sat there appeared like the crystalline brightness of Jasper. Please take note of these key words here, Jasper. We'll come to that in a moment. Okay, Jasper. And then what? And the fiery sardius. These are all types of precious stones. I've never seen them before myself. I've never seen them before myself, except for gold and diamond. I've never seen diamond before. <laughs> except for good. And and second, the throne was a halo that looked like a rainbow. Then four, 24 other thrones surrounded the throne and seated on these thrones were 24 elders, the members of the heavenly Sahindrin arrayed in white clothing with crowns of gold upon their head. Out of the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne, seven blazing torches burned, which are the seven spirits of God, sevenfold Holy Spirit. I explained that. He is not saying that the spirit of God is seven, has got sevenfold. No, no, no. We say in the Hebrew concept, seven just means perfection, meaning God's spirit is perfect, complete, adequate, lacks no defect. So don't, don't be carried away by these metaphors, okay? And in front of the throne, there was also what looked like a transparent glassy sea. Did you notice in all of John's writing, he kept on using this simile like, 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 like. Like, that means it's not exactly, that is the best description. So once again, that will lead you to know, don't be carried away by the literal. He said like, he didn't say it was like, he didn't say it was like. So don't translate it or interpret it literally like a transparent glassy sea as if it's of crystal. And around the throne in the center, at each side of the throne were four living creatures who were full of 
eyes in front and behind with intelligence as to what is before and at the rear of them. All this refers to the realm of God. The first living creature being was like a lion. I explained that. The second living creature, like an ox, I explained that. The third, the face of man, he's talking about the humanity of Christ. And the fourth was like a flying eagle, talking about the resurrection. Okay? He went on and on and spoke about the same thing all the way right to the verse 11. Now, for us to understand that this is not something futuristic, let us go back and feast our eyes on verse 3. That is where I want to work on a little bit. And he who sat there appeared like, once again, simile, simile, S-I-M-I-L-E, which it means comparison, right? He did not say it is like. So what did he liken his appearance? He now brought precious stones, jasper, and the fiery sardius, right? Let us look at what, what those two mean, right? And you see once again that the emphasis is on Christ. Pay attention from here. So let's go back to my notes. Let's go back to my notes, right? So now look at the look at the diagram that I have before you. Now I will not go into the the, the, the you know in terms of the um the crown that the high priest is wearing. This is what he was talking about here. Can you see on your screens these precious stones? Twelve of them. Can you see that here? Now all these precious stones were pointing. To something about Christ. Now, first of all, the 12 stones here refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. So let's do a little bit of work on these stones. Let's do a little bit of work. Please take note, they were on his chest. They were on his chest. That's why they call it breastplate on chest. Did you notice that in the Old Testament, one of the ways that Israel tried to recognize God was that they call him Jehovah and under the Old, Old, Old Testament, they call him El Shaddai. The word El Shaddai or El Shaddai means the double-breasted one. It, it's just, it was just a term to refer to resting in somebody's bosom or, or being united with somebody, okay, or representing somebody. So when he talked about this here, what we call the breastplate on the chest of the high priest, and the high priest was referring to Christ, it referred to what? Representing and taking us with him wherever he is. It talks about the principle of identification. But let us let us go a bit further into this. And let's look. So what is the symbol of the vestment of the high priest under the Old Testament? The 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest that we just saw stood for the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was also symbolic of the 12 foundational apostles of the Lamb, the 12 disciples. And what does it symbolize? They symbolize the uniformity of the message of Christ. That there is not a different message in the Old Testament and a different message in what we call the New Testament. Even that term, old and new, we've got to be careful, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Technically, there is only one testament. There is only one testament. The testament of Christ. But it was because of the hardness of the heart of Israel that what we call the Old Testament came into focus. And then later, when Christ resurrected, we call it new. But the word new does not mean new as in brand new. The word new actually means in the Greek, everlasting. And the word old does not mean old as in ancient. It means temporary. So when we say Old Testament, we call it temporary testament. When we say New Testament, we're referring to everlasting that way does not change why under the old testament the guys that were responsible for dealing with sin the high priest they had to be changed and they died but christ lives forever glory to god so when we look at this 12 tribes of israel symbolized by those 12 precious stones and it stands for the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles and they symbolize that the message is one the uniformity of the message of Christ. Can you see that? So why? Through the 12 tribes, from Genesis to Malachi, we receive the message as a promise. Through what? Prophecies, uh, dreams, interaction of angels under the Old Testament or the temporary 
relationship style, right? Then through the 12 apostles after resurrection, the same message is explained as having been fulfilled. So it is one continuous message. Whereas under the old types and shadows, under the new fulfilled. That is why he told them to the high priest to wear 12 stones, representing the 12 tribes. And, and one of those stones is what we're going to deal with. What we're going to deal with is what the Jasper and the what and the Sadducees as there's two examples. Okay. So let us look at the two of these precious stones. The first one is Jasper. The word Jasper, Jasper, the most common word for it in the Hebrew, Jasper is Yashefet. Yashefet. Jasper, Yashefet. And it's found in Exodus 28, 20, and also Exodus 39, 13, which describes the last of the 12 jewel on the breastplate of Aaron, the high priest. Okay? Now, the word Yashefet, translated as Jasper, literally means polish. Christ polished our spirits by his death. Jasper is recognized a symbol of the glory of God. See that? What is the glory of God? The resurrection of Christ and the gift of his spirit. Can you see that now? In all its splendor, brightness, and beauty. Did we not just read that in 1 Peter 1.10, he said that when the prophets of the Old Testament spoke, they spoke about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Jasper is a symbol of the glory, the resurrection of Christ. Can you see that now? It talks about splendor, brightness, and beauty. What about the other stone called Sardius, or is sometimes called Carnelian, also known as the Sard? It's a mineral red in color and commonly described as glassy, translucent, that is semi-transparent, semi-opaque, semi-precious gemstone. Where red would definitely refer to the blood of Christ. The etymological origin of the Carnelian or the Sardius comes from the Latin word conum, used for cornel cherry. And you know, cherry is red in color. Assuming it to be cherry red, blood red in color, translucent light was glowing from the one seated on the throne. So the Sardius, Carnelian stone, was placed first in order upon the high priest breastplate. So let's go back to the picture. Let's go back to the picture and, and it will be make, made much clear. Get, go, let's go back to the picture. So here we are. Can you see here? I've put my Keza. This is the this is the Sadius. Can you see that now? Red. First, what, what comes to mind? Huh? The blood of Jesus. What is the blood of Jesus? His nature, his life, his life. So showing that the first thing God will do will be, will be to give his life. See that? But whilst it is representing that, it represents one of the 12 tribes. So when the high priest wears this, he goes into the holy of holies where no man can go, right? Yeah, And that means he carries Israel, even though they are standing outside as people, he carries them symbolically on his chest, talking about the fact that we are united with Christ in his death as well. Can you see that? So that we are united with him in his death, united with him in his burial, united with him in his three days and three nights, united with him in his resurrection. He carried us in him. He did not do it for himself. He did it for us. See that? That's why it says we died with Christ. We rose with him. You were not there. I was not there. But in the mind of God, when Christ died, you died. When Christ resurrected, you resurrected. Can you see the same thing? That was the symbolism of this. But don't take my word for it. Let's travel some more and get more clearer in that regard. Let's go to Bible verses. Now, it's the epistles that explains the entire Bible. Let's go to Exodus and let's look at that, those stones a little bit. Let's look at those stones a little bit. Let's look at those stones a little bit and we'll, we'll, it, will, it will get clearer. Let me start from Exodus chapter 28. Okay. From among the Israelites, take your brother Aaron and his sons with him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Itamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make for Aaron your brother a sacred garment. The word sacred means 
treated special or put aside for a specific purpose. Appointed official dress set apart for special holy services for honor and beauty. He goes on and on and on and on. All of it. I don't want to go into that, but I want to get you to the, the precious stones that were in his chest. Look at it there. Okay. The skillfully woven grinding band, which is on the effort, shall be made of the same of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet stuff, and fine twine linen. Verse 9. And you shall take two onyx. Now he's coming to the precious stones burial stones and engrave on them the names of the 12 sons of Israel. Called, talking about identification. Okay. Then he, he tells them to arrange them in a particular order. Okay. Then the verse 12. And you shall put the two stones upon the two shoulder straps of the effort. Okay. Of the high priest as memorial stones for Israel. And Aaron shall bear the, their names upon his two shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. He goes on and on and on. And on talks about all of it and, and on and on. Then he comes to the, the stones here. The breastplate, what we just the picture I showed you, shall be square and doubled, a span nine inches shall be its length, and a span shall be its breadth. Look at verse 17. You shall set it in four rows, four rows of three. Four times three is 12. Okay, and look at the look at the stones. A sardius first, topaz, and the carbuncle shall be the first row. Okay, we've got in that right. Okay, yeah. Next, 18. The second row will be what? An emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, so-called at that time. Okay, we've got that right as well. Okay, then the next row, and then the, the third row shall be a jacin. I've never seen these stones before. <laughs> an agate, an amethyst. Okay, all of them talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, meaning representation. Fourth, and the fourth row, a burial, an onyx, and a jasper, the last, and they shall all be set in gold filigree. If you are a metallurgist, you understand this better. <laughs> okay, all right. And these stones shall be 12, according to the names of the sons of Israel, like the engravings of a signet, each with its name of the 12 tribes. You shall make for the breastplate chains of pure gold twisted like cord. So back to the picture again, then I move on. So there we are. There we are. You see that? Have you seen that? The Bible explains itself. If you did not take your time to do a study and a research, you would have concluded and made this something, like we say in my country, hushos. You know, somebody would take it and preach it some way. But that is it's referring to Christ. It's referring to Christ. How he represented us. How he carried us in him. Right? The Bible tells us that what? He bore the iniquity of us all. See that now? He bore the iniquity of us all. This is what this was prefiguring, foreshadowing, pointing ahead what Christ will do to sin. Now, do we have any answer to that? Obviously, because the epistles, the books of Romans to the book of Jude, they are the explanatory notes of the entire Old Testament. So let's see if we've got anything that speaks about this. You see, I'm doing that for you to know how to correctly interpret the Bible. You didn't see, I didn't stay with only revelation. I make the Bible explain itself. That is how you do excellent Bible study. Never ever use Bible verses on a stand alone. Anything, check whether, check what Jesus said about it. Check what Paul said about it. Check what Peter said about it. Check what James said about it. Check what the writer of Hebrews said about it. And Paul's letters to Timothy, to Titus, to Philemon, to Jude. You must check it all. Very important. The moment you become lazy, you will miss a point and you will begin to teach error. The Bible calls for diligent study, attention to detail. So let us look at what the Bible says about that. So have you seen that the book of Revelation is still talking about the same thing. That is why earlier in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, the emphasis was that their teachings had gone off course. Stay central, Christ, the main, the main message. So let's look at a few things, and then we shall close for today. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Now, the book, the word Hebrew means Israel or the Jews. So there were three classes of people 
that the writer of Hebrews wrote. Well, some say Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, others said it was Apollos. Others also said that it was sustainers, you know, but uh, it doesn't matter. You know, when we, when, we, when we meet Jesus, we know, but I believe the language is that of Paul because Paul was the one that was so astute and academic, you know, and erudite in his writing. Nobody could write like this apart from Paul. So I, 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 I believe, you know, that, that Paul was the writer of the book of Hebrews amongst all the debates. So Hebrews chapter 10. So when he wrote to Hebrews, right, remember the word Hebrew means Israel or Jews. And there were three classes of people the book of Hebrews addresses. Jews that were born again correctly. Jews that were born again, but some guys had come into poison their minds to let them go back to the law of Moses as a requirement of salvation. And then there was a third group, which was Jews who did not accept that salvation by faith in Christ is enough. These guys were Judaizers and they were still of the law of Moses. So let's read, let's read how he explained these things writing to the Jews. Because remember, they were the ones that had this Levitical order. They had the law of Moses. The law of Moses was written only to Israel. The Gentiles, all nations apart from Israel, were not required to follow the Ten Commandments. So I find it very funny when people begin to quote things from the Old Testament to their believer. That was for Israel alone. The law was for Israel. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter, in, in Romans chapter 10, that to Israel was the law. To Israel, the law was for them alone. No other nation. No other nation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law or the law of Moses was merely a rude outline, foreshadowing of the good things to come, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never by offering the same sacrifices under the law of Moses continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. For if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? And who was the one that received the sacrifices? The high priest, the picture that I showed you there. And it was done once a year. Since the worshiper had once for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt of consciousness of sin. Verse 3 of Hebrews 10. But as it is under the law of Moses, under the high priest of the law of Moses, these sacrifices of animals annually, yearly, bring a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Because the blood of bulls under the Old Testament and goats under the Old Testament is powerless to take away sins. So I am surprised when, when we are teaching the Bible, when we are quoting Old Testament, you know, to believers, we don't understand this principle. If, if those laws could have taken away sins, then it should have been Israel. But he says that it was impossible. And one thing you must remember, question, any time that they brought the sacrifices, did it mean that Israel will no longer sin? No. The animals were, what, the animals were sacrificed as what I call sin insurance. So their sin insurance was paid for one year. Did it mean that they will never sin? No. That is why the animal was sacrificed. So it was all inclusive. Uh, Israel were standing outside, but they were represented by the animal, the bull or the goat or the ram. Can you understand? And there were two or three of them. said Because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless. To take away sins. Verse 5. Hence, when he Christ entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. That's not what God was looking for. But instead, you have made a body ready for me to offer. Why? Because sin took place in a body of man called Adam, not in animals. Can you understand that? Let us look at also the same chapter but in another translation, in another translation, in the, in the message Bible, look at, look at that here. The old plan, uh, he's talking about relationship style under the Old Testament, was only a hint of the good things in the new plan, or what we call the New Testament. Since the, the, the old law plan wasn't complete in itself, it couldn't complete those who followed it. Ah, 
<laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see that? It could not complete those who followed it. Did you see that? It could not. So I am surprised that we are trying to we are trying to preach Old Testament laws which could not complete even those that followed it to born again people. And the Bible says in the book of Old Testament that we should not do this, we should not do this. That was for Israel. Look at next sentence. No matter how many sacrifices were offered year after year, they never added up to a complete solution. If they had, the worshippers would have gone blissfully on their way, no longer dragged down by their sins. But instead of removing awareness of sin, S-I-N, he didn't say sins, sin nature, sin DNA, when those animals were sacrificed, the, those animal sacrifices were repeated over and over, they actually heightened awareness and guilt. The plain fact is that bull and goat blood cannot get rid of sin. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see that? I'm surprised. That is what is meant by this prophecy put in the mouth of Christ. You don't want sacrifices and offerings year after year by the high priest picture that I showed you. You have prepared a body for me for a sacrifice. It is not fragrance and smoke from the altar that wet your appetite. So I said, he's talking about Jesus. I am here to do it your way, oh God. The way it is described in your book. Did you see that? Let's go to the next tab here. Hebrews chapter 5. So let us look at the role of the high priest. Let's look at the high priest again. We are dealing with Revelation chapter 4. There he is. So this figure of the high priest was Christ. It was pointing to Christ. So have you seen again that right in Revelation chapter 4, what we read, he's talking about what Christ did. See that same thing from Genesis to Malachi, Jesus said, the writings are concerning me, what I've done. In First Peter, he said, it concerns the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. In Revelation, in talking about the jasper and the, and the sardius, which was one of the stones in the high priest, it was pointing to how Christ represented that in his death, burial, resurrection. Can you see that now? Nothing futuristic. Everything has been done. Amen. So let's go back to a few verses. Allow me just a few minutes and I will land. We need to get this very clear. Let's go to another one. Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God. Take note. To offer both gifts and sacrifices. What is the main thing? For sins. Because the issue of man is sin in Adam. That was the issue. For sins. He is able to exercise gentleness and forbearance toward the erring, since he himself also is liable to moral weakness and physical infirmity. Verse 3. And because of this, he is obliged to offer sacrifice for his own sins, the priest, the high priest, as well as for those people, showing that they are fallible. Besides, one does not appropriate for himself the honor of being high priest. Can you see that? It's not everybody. But he is called by God and receives it of him just as Aaron did. Look at verse 5. So too, Madabrasikaya. Madabrasikaya. Christ. Did you see how he linked Aaron or Aaron, the high priest, as a typology of Jesus? So too, Christ, the Messiah did not exalt himself to be made what? A high priest. When was Jesus made a high priest? After resurrection. So we have a man who is a minister of sin. Just like we've got somebody, minister of agriculture, minister of trade and tourism. His own is different. He's not a minister of trade and tourism. I have good news for you. He's a minister of sin. Question, there is no sin bigger than Jesus. <laughs> so to Christ, the Messiah, did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. 
for was appointed and exalted by him who said, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Verse 5 refers to when God became a man in Christ, the incarnation. You are my son in the river Jordan. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But when he said that, Jesus had not done even one miracle, but he called him pleased. So Jesus is the pleaser of God. And if the pleaser of God lives in you, you please God always. Okay, Badaya. The pleaser of God is Christ. Christ is the pleasant bread of God. The pleasant bread lives in you. By virtue of him in you, you please God always. Whether you pray, whether you don't pray, why? It is his nature that qualifies you. He said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Verse 6, he, as he also says in another place, he's quoting Psalm. You are a priest appointed forever after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. Why? All the high priests died. Verse 7, in the days of his flesh as a human being, offered up definite special petitions for that which he not only wanted in the garden of Gethsemane, but needed and supplication with strong crying, garden of Gethsemane and tears to him who always was able to save him out of death. And he was heard because of his reverence toward God, his God in fear, his piety in that he shrank. The reason why he was praying, the reason why he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane and said, let this cup pass was because of this. In that Kabota Kabataya, he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. On the cross, the only thing, let me use it, let me use very bad representation, very bad representation, very bad representation, which is not true. But just to let you understand, the only thing that Jesus, for a lack of a better term, dreaded was to be separated from himself as the Father. It has never happened that God is separated from himself because on the cross, he shouted, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why at that time he became sin. So that is when, this is the area that he dreaded to be separated. He is always light. Jesus is always light. He has never known darkness. So he got united with Satan. He got united with darkness. He got united with sin. He got united with death. He got united with rejection. How do we know that? Kebataya. Isaiah 53. He said, for it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. God does not kill Madaya. Why? He killed himself in Jesus. <laughs> you didn't hear that. God does not kill. God does not get angry. He put all his fury and put it on himself in Christ. Wow. Wow. He shrank. The high priest could not do that. Huh? See that now? Talking about the high priest, the picture we saw. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That is why a person can never lose their salvation. You can't. It is, let me tell you, it is absolutely irrevocably and equivocally uh, impossible for any believer to lose their salvation. What Jesus did is not cheap because salvation is not a thing. It's a nature. That's what we are doing here. He did it once and for all. See that now? Let's look at another thing there. Look at that. And although he was a son, he learned active, special obedience through what he suffered. What did he suffer? Separated from the bright presence of the Father. Where? In hell for three days and three nights. Did you see that? So that you don't have to go there again. So that I don't have to experience that darkness again. Never. Never. Ever. Although he was a son, he suffered that. And his completed experience, making him perfectly equipped, he became the author and source of eternal salvation to all those who give heed and obey. The obedience means to believe. Huh? Look at verse 10. That is what Revelation chapter 4 was trying to portray to Apostle John. And he being a Jew understood the symbolism. That's why he didn't ask any question. And he, Jesus, 
by doing that, by his death, burial, and resurrection. And when he resurrected, he being designated, he's talking about his new office. New office. Being designated and recognized and saluted by God as high priest after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. Just like this picture. Wait, wait, wait. Don't lose sight of the picture. Let's go back there. Here. Yeah. This breastplate here. Yeah. Under the Old Testament, anytime the high priest put this on, he's indirectly carrying Israel with him into the Holy of Holies. What was inside the Holy of Holies? The Ark of God. What was inside the Ark of God? The Spirit of God. What was in there? The Law of Moses, the, 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 the tablets, the Aaron's, Aaron's stuff that budded, and the pot of manna. All those three things refer to Christ. So what he's saying is that when you and I could not go, God's presence, which nobody could go because of the sin of Adam, the high priest carried us there. Let's bring it to after resurrection. Where you and I could not go concern the sin of Adam, Jesus carried us there. <laughs> that is the, that's what we are looking at now. Oh my goodness. That's a place to jump for joy. That's a place to shout and let the devil go mad. That's a place to rejoice. Paul said, rejoice. I say rejoice and rejoice again. Rejoice in that fact. Look, the devil can throw all his shots at you, but you are carried in the breast of Jesus. You are carried in the bosom of Jesus, meaning you are united in his spirit. No weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. They can carry your name to anywhere. They can speak against you anywhere, but you are carried in the bosom of Jesus. He paid a dear price for that. And by that dear price, I'm telling you, Satan is no match. Satan is no match. Finally, Kebozabaya, Verse 7. Mm, Hebrews chapter 7. Let me go down and show you something there. And I close with it. Ah. Look at this here. And this becomes more plainly evident when another priest arises who bears the likeness of Melchizedek, who has been constituted a priest not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement. These are very serious legal matters. Satan knows about that, not in detail. It's only believers that don't know. An externally imposed command concerning his physical ancestry. But on the basis, Jesus is our high priest, not like the one I'm showing the picture, but the basis of it is on the power of an endless and indestructible life. Can you see that? Endless and indestructible life. And that endless life, that indestructible life is where? It's in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> oh my goodness. Verse 17, Satan doesn't like this. It's a sucker punch for it is witness of him. You are a priest forever, El Olam, after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. Did you see that? Oh my, let me go down. Let me go down a bit. Ah, look at, look at that. Verse 23. Again, the former successive line of priests was made upon many because they were prevented by death under the law of Moses from continually perpetually in office. Oh, but he, Jesus, who's, ah, yeah, yeah, who holds his priesthood unchangeably because he lives forever. Oh, look at this one. And let me close with this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's a verse you should keep to memory. Therefore, Jesus is able also to save to the uttermost. Somebody says to the guttermost. <laughs> Completely, Ayabukaya, perfectly, Kadadaya, finally, Izebrakaya, and for all time, Akodaya, and eternity, those who come to God through him. Since he always, every time, it means perpetual, uh, living to make petition to God and intercede with him and intervene for them. Ah, ah, ah. Here he is. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, as I close today, let me introduce to you our high priest. That is his office right now. He's a minister of sin. Sin cannot stand between God and the believer. Sin can never stand between God and the believer. Here he is, the high priest. Huh? Huh? Perfectly adapted to our needs. Hey, that was fitting. Oh, oh, oh. Holy. If he's holy, I am holy. Blameless. If he's blameless, I'm blameless. Don't forget. The stones, he 
is how he we are represented. He carries us with him. It means that we are united with him. So if he's holy, I am holy. You are holy. If he's blameless, you are blameless. I am blameless. In the eyes of God, unstained by sin, S-I-N, the DNA of sin, separated from sinners, Kabadaya, and exalted higher than the heavens. My goodness. Mm, mm, mm. He has no day-by-day -day necessity, as do this, each of these high priests, like the picture has shown, to offer sacrifice first under the law of their own personal sins, and then for those of the people, showing they are not perfect. Because he, Jesus, oh my goodness, he, Jesus, met all, not some, all, not some, all, not some, the requirements once for all, when he brought himself as a sacrifice, which he offered up. <laughs> End of story. I don't understand what the problem of the believer is. I don't understand. I don't understand. How can you read? How can you read things like this? How can you? How can you read such such you know comprehensive truths like this and say a believer can lose their salvation? Either you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand the word of God. You don't. You are reading your thoughts into it. Salvation is not some cheap thing that Jesus did on the side. That's why it's called eternal life. It's not temporary life. It's eternal life. And that is what we are, we are reading here in the Revelation chapter 4. When he said, and he who sat there appeared like the crystalline brightness of Jasper, the stones on the high priest chest, and fiery service, talking about how he represented us in his death, burial, resurrection. Letting you know the book of Revelation is not about some future event, rather of what Christ has done for the church. And the teaching must stay on that, not teach otherwise. Otherwise, you run into another gospel and there'll be no reward for that, for who preaches like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Sarkodie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.